Okay, let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 4. We're going to continue in our study of Revelation today. We <coughs> left off last time in chapter 4. Let's see, what we need to do here is, um, before we do any reading, we're going to do a little bit of talking here to kind of, kind of paint the picture for just a moment. Um, what we're about to look at here in chapters 4 and 5, and you kind of have to take these two chapters together, is essentially we are looking at, we are like looking at the glory of the, of, if you would, the throne scene, Okay. Imagine if you were to take a minute and to look into heaven, and this is what John is being shown. Now, it's all figurative, of course, as far as we don't take what we're about to read literal in the description. But we are, he's basically taking a look or being shown what we'll call the throne scene in heaven. Now, the placement of this is after the death of Christ on the cross of Calvary. It is the victory of the church. The victory of the church. But it's not after judgment. Okay, The judgment scene will come later. And, uh, and I'll illustrate this if we understand one point of this properly. And we'll talk about it here in a minute. But down here in verse 4 of chapter 4, he says, um, let's see. Come down here a little bit. Um, there, uh, verse 6, I'm sorry. He says there before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. Now if we jump over for a moment to Revelation chapter 21. Let's jump forward here in this book to Revelation 21. You'll notice there in verse... Um, not 21, I apologize for that. It's going to be verse um, chapter 20, not 21. Let me go back one more chapter here. Let's see. <clears throat> Bear with me. Just um, no. 21 1. I was in the right location there. 21 1. Um, it was right in front of me. I apologize for that. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And look at the phrase in verse 1, also there was no more sea. Okay, um, It's very likely or it's very possible that in the vision that John saw at the beginning of Revelation 4, the, the sea of glass as a crystal, by the time we hit Revelation 21, is now gone. Okay. So there's definitely two different time periods here within this. The first one would be looking at the victory of the church here on this earth, the victory of Christ, and our victory in Jesus Christ. But then this very well being looking at after judgment. And we'll talk more about that here as we get down to verse 6 and why that may be the case. But the point is that I wanted to kind of bring to light that what we're looking at in chapters 4 and 5 would be essentially the throne room scene. John is now being showed, given a glimpse into heaven and the, 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 the sovereignty and the glory that is there. All right, any thoughts or comments, Gene? Yeah, then he's, he's, finished, he's finished with the admonition to the seven churches. Yes. And he's telling them, in essence, to look forward. And now he's going to tell them what they're going to see. That's what right. They, what, the, what the advantage is of them doing what he tells them to do the first three chapters, and this is what this is the reward you've got to look forward to. I, gotta, I understand it's in two sections. One yeah. is before judgment, and one is at judgment, and then thereafter. But it's still, it's something so much greater than they've seen that he's also telling them this is what you've got to look forward to. That's right. And with all the persecution that they were and would be facing, he's telling them you've won. You you have the victory. And the victory is found in Jesus Christ and his victory. All right, any other thoughts or comments? All right, let's go ahead and do a little bit of reading now. Let's um, come back up here. And Aaron, we'll start with you this morning. If you would read for us Revelation chapter 4, read for us the first two verses, please. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. 
And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, the one set on the throne. All right, Dale, let's read verses 3 and 4. And he who sat there was like a jasper and sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in the appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. All right, and let's see. Uh, Miss Karen, would you want to read verses 5 and 6? <clears throat> and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. <clears throat> and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts, full of eyes before and behind. All right, and let's see. Hunter, if you would read for us verses 7 and 8. The first living creature was like a lion, a second living creature was like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures each had a six wings, the four of eyes around and before. <coughs> and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. All right, and Jeremiah, do you want to read verses 9 and 10? Yes, sir. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne to this forever and ever. And tw the 24 <coughs> elders fall down behind the before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, All right, and Maxine, if you read verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. All right, thank you. Let's all go back now to verse 1. <clears throat> uh, one technical question I had to reinstall this program. Is the font as big as what we normally have it, or do we need to go a little bit bigger, Miss Betty? It's fine. It's fine? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, Miss Leanne's the other one, so I'll check with her next time. <laughs> All right, so let's start there in verse, uh, verse 1 for just a moment. As Gene pointed out a while ago, you have um, his letter to the seven churches is now completed. And so he says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Now, it's, we cannot accurately picture the visions that the prophets were shown by the Lord down through the years. We have a description of what they saw. But, you know, it, it, imagine standing there and in the midst of the sky or in the midst of whatever you're looking at, a door opens. You know, a, a door to a place that, that you had never seen before. Here he says a door standing open in heaven. And so the first voice which he heard was like what? A trumpet. Now, whenever you think about this for a moment, a trumpet typically at this time was used for what purpose? Yeah. To, to announce, okay. Um, to send out an official call. You think about some of the instructions uh, when we study through Nehemiah, uh, somewhere around, I think, 7, 8, 9, possibly, uh, when they were building, getting the, the walls completed, they were told to listen for the sound, to listen for the call of the trumpet for that sound. And so he says here that I heard, the voice that he heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, one that's carrying an announcement or, or a call, um, kind, of, kind of putting forth kind of the idea behind that. And so it says there, come up here and I will show you what? Yeah, look at this phrase here. Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. All right. Now, this is very important when we stop and think about what Revelation is about. 
Many people, as we discussed in the beginning of this, look at Revelation as being something that was thousands of years waiting to happen. But as we saw in chapter 1, he again says here that I'm showing you things which must take place after this. Okay? So when you read Revelation, you don't read it as some, you know, it's 2014 almost, surely some of the events will finally take place. No. He's talking about things that took place immediately thereafter um, and, and that was significant to the Christians of that day. Any thoughts or comments? All right, look at verse 2 then. So verse 2, John says, Immediately I was what? Yeah, he says, Immediately I was in the Spirit. We saw this last time over in John cha or Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. Where, exactly. Notice there he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Okay. Now the idea of him being in the Spirit is simply the idea of him being inspired to write and to uh, inspired to write what he writes, inspired to teach what he would teach, and in this case, inspired to see what he saw. Okay, and that's probably the, the simplest of explanations as far as far as the phrase "I was in the Spirit." Okay, receiving uh, by the gift of the Holy Spirit uh, this particular vision that he saw. All right. So, any thoughts about that? All right, now let's, let's look at this next phrase here. All right, he says, And behold, a throne was set in a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So the first thing he says here that he sees is what? There's a throne. Exactly. There was a throne, and there was someone sitting on the throne. Now consider the description here. Uh, bear in mind, this is again not a literal description all right, of the things in heaven, but these are things that are used to kind of illustrate the, the majesty of it. Um, hyperbole might be a proper term that we would use in talking today. Um, have you ever heard someone say, I'm so hungry I could eat a, eat a horse? Okay. <laughs> or your mama says, I've told you a thousand times to get your room clean. Yeah. You say, no, it's 578, but who's counting? Um, it, it's someone says, um, you know, it's like, um, well, just you know, different illustrations like that, where you use something that you don't literally mean, but you use it figuratively to illustrate the magnitude of whatever it might be. Well, this is what we're looking at here in verse three. He who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. Now, notice that last word, appearance, there. Uh, what is what is a jasper? Yeah, it's a type of beautiful stone. Um, I had I meant to call this up. Give me just a second. We'll see if we can do this real quick. Um, well, the king there, the king that was spoken of once of having jasper walls. So there's another use. For some reason, I want to think it's a pearl. I don't know. All right. Well, let's see here. That's a guess. <laughs> I looked a couple of these yesterday just to make sure. And um, all right, Google, Google is very good here in giving us uh, kind of an, an automatic picture here of this. And um, this is one image of a, of a jasper stone, I guess, would be one way of looking at it. And um, they kind of, now to me, it's, maybe that looks beautiful to us, maybe it doesn't, but at that time period, it was a beautiful it stone. It is what it is. Yeah. And, um, and this is just one image out of, out of probably several thousands we could probably look at. But it's, it is the appearance. All right. Now the other stone, what did you say the other stone was? Sardius. All right, Sardius. Does anyone have a different translation that renders it a little bit differently? Carnelian. All right, how do you spell that? C-A-R-N-E-L-I-A-N. All right. Here's Carnelian stone. And... Um, oh, it varies. Yeah, the newer translation, the uh, New American Standard Version, the NIV, um, and the, the English Standard Version will all render it carnelian. And that just kind of gives you an, an idea, especially this particular cover. Um, it's still a red stone? Yeah, it's still kind of, kind of a, a red type stone, and I don't want to buy that, but, you know. <laughs> Actually, there we go. We're going to view it. 
Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so just make. Yeah. <laughs> Add the cart. No, I don't think so. Sorry. Can use this. All right. So, close that real quick. So anyway, and what's interestingly enough, when 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 you research the carnelian stone, as we looked at, it is some it is similar to a stone called sard, S A R D, and so there's similarities between the two, and I figure that's why some translation will use a carnelian instead of sardis stone, just so that people would know. But the point is, you saw the the red brilliance of that, okay? The the, the red brilliance, the the richness of that. And so he says here that he was like Jasper in the Sardis stone or Carnelian stone in appearance. And that's the key, it's the appearance of it. So imagine those two stones in a much larger fashion. And what, whatever John was seeing, it wasn't like he was looking at two huge rocks or, or jewels, but what he was looking at had the brilliance of it, or had, had, had the, the color of it, if you would. And then he says, and there was a what around the throne? Yeah, there was a, ra a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Now, what has there ever been the use of a rainbow in biblical history, Jeremiah? Yes, um, it's in the Old Testament, Genesis, whenever Noah finally um, found dry land, uh, God put a rainbow to show that he would never flood the whole earth again. All right, so, Hunter, then what, what would that mean to the people every time they saw the rainbow? It means that, it means that they would never have a flood by water again. That's true. Your husband said to his wife, well, don't panic, the there's a rainbow, we're in good shape. <laughs> yeah, or what, it's just not going to be a world flood by God. Right, the, yeah, right, the world will not be destroyed by water again. Now, it may be that what we're looking at here in this rainbow is the idea of God's mercy, of God's grace. All right. His what? Covenant. His covenant, yeah. And so there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Um, any thoughts or comments about that? Well, that like an emerald, that means like green? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. An emerald would kind of carry um, kind of a, a green color there too. Let me bring that back up here a second. I've really thought about building a mount to put the like monitor life. for two seats. Like what? Like life. Yeah, yeah. I think that'd be a good way of looking and at precious. that. Precious. Uh, precious stone. Hmm. Kind of gives you an, an idea there of. Um, it basically um, means like Yeah. So. Kind of means like life. All right, so yeah, you, you have, and so imagine the rainbow, but yet with, with that type of a brilliance there to that, with that type of brilliance there. All right, so when we're looking at this whole setup here, this, this, this imagery, not setup, is he seeing something that can only be described in things that would be of value to us? Because to truly describe what he saw would be, uh, would be beyond the possibility. Yeah. Well, it was a value to them as well, the two stones mentioned there, the uh, Jasper and the Sardis stone. Uh, jasper was used to make vases and uh, little boxes and everything, highly polished, generally red, uh, could be a little bit different color. The Sardis was generally red, but it could also be flesh color. Okay. The thought here might be that what John is describing here is God sitting on his throne in his scarlet robes which was okay. a sign of royalty to begin with because okay. only, the, only the kings and the uh, high royalty wore scarlet robes. So he was describing a uh, point of power here, of majesty. Okay. Uh, same thing with the rainbow uh, and the appearance like an emerald. Uh, again, the description is uh, the majesty, the purity of God, and the power of God. Okay, I think that's right. The brilliance, you know. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Um, I would kind of look at it when it says a rainbow in the shape of an emerald. Mm -hmm. I would look at it as God is able to create light. Okay, all right. Light is so powerful. And, and not only to create, but in this context to preserve 
in our case, to preserve our spiritual life. And our soul. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing to note, um, let's take a minute and look over to Hebrews 12. Uh, one, one commentator suggested that uh, with the color of the emeralds there, that um, it, it could have kind of symbolized even the, in the judgment of God in Hebrews 12, 29, for our God is a consuming fire. You know, might have been even kind of a symbolism of that as well. And that would go back to what Dale was talking about in that general description of that too. All right, any thoughts or comments? <clears throat> All right, let's see. Let's continue now with this throne room scene. And let's come down to verse 4. So he says that around the throne there were how many other thrones? All right, yeah, around the thrones there were 24 thrones. And he says, and on the thrones I saw 24 who? Elders. Elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. All right. Speaking of heads, this verse is one of many that would leave you scratching yours. You know. What's that? All right, that is a very good question. And let's spend a minute talking about that. At least one possibility, and there may be others, okay. What is half of 24? 12. All right, 12. So we're going to do 12 and then 12. Okay. Okay, that's right. If you think about Old Testament time frame, you then have the 12 tribes. If you think about the New Testament time period, you have the 12 apostles. Now, what is the one thing that these two have in common? They both are the shepherd. twelve. They both are twelve. Okay, they're they're both twelve, but, but what else? What did you say, Miss Pat? Well they shepherd they shepherded at the time they were. Okay. All right. She, all right. You can kinda of look at least with the apostles for sure. They were and the and then the, the very heads of the twelve tribes, maybe. All right. Rhonda. And they were picked hand picked by God to do a, a service for him. Okay, hand picked by God. Okay. All right, what else? God chose them specifically. All right. Yeah, he knew which ones to specifically pick. That's possible. In the tribes. Let, let's expand this a little bit. At least this according to a, a one commentary that I looked at suggests that if you expand it, the 12 tribes here would represent all of God's people under the old law. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then the 12 apostles could represent all those who are taught under the new law, okay? Re symbolizing, therefore, then all of the Old Testament and all of the New Testament. And all of these are coming together clothed in white robes. Now, how do we know that he's talking about the, all the saved in general? When we come down later in, into chapter 5, we'll complete the scene with them talking about what the Lamb has done. And we'll look at that here in a minute. Any thoughts? You've got, I mean, you've actually got 14 apostles. That's true. The five is in Paul. Right. So there must be some other significance besides, besides 12 apostles. Unless it, unless it, there was meant to be the original 12. I would think just the, the if, if that is what it means, then it would be just the, the, the apostles as a group of those who taught the word of the Lord. The Going back to, yeah, to the original 12. Huh. Minus Judas. Judas. But even Jesus, Judas was one of the original. Yeah. Um, but again, we're not, if that's true, if that's a good rendering of it, it's not intended to be specific as more of a general picture. You know, 24 elders sitting on 24 thrones. Um, right? Could it be too, you know, the, I look at it as the 12 tribes had the original truth as far as they were given God's law and the 12 apostles began as far as the work of God in the New Testament, you know, they were given the law to share. And they, they were the, the teachers of that. And, yeah. the, you know, you have to be in contact with one or the other to get the truth. You can't, you know, you can't be a Gentile and be part of the 12 tribes without being proselyted in. And in order to get in contact with what the apostles were teaching, well, you have to come to Christ. You have to come to mm -hmm. the teaching to get in contact with Christ. Okay, that's right. Well, let me take issue that mm -hmm. today, Paul was the preacher, was the, uh, uh, preacher for the Gentiles. Right. So, uh, 
the law of Christ was taught through Paul uh, to a much greater extent than the original 12 apostles. Well, think, I guess what I'd have to say is, is think about what Jesus says to, to Peter and the other apostles. That I'll give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Of course, Paul wasn't there in that, in that, when that was done. But it's just the general idea of the apostolic authority, you know, uh, and of the, the 12 apostles. Although there were, there were uh, two more added to that. Um, let's jump forward for just a moment to verse 11 here with this. And... Um, of chapter 5. Verse 11 of chapter 5. And let's, we, we, we are in the same throne room scene, but we're going to jump ahead now a little bit. He says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, same 24 elders that we referenced earlier. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. We're talking about the many angels around the throne, the living creatures, including the twelve elders. And they were all saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen, and the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. So this whole throne scene is reflecting the, it's, at this point, it's showing the victory of the church um, and seen within the heavenly vision because the lamb has already died, the lamb was slain, and they were all worshipping and praising him. So um, that's why at least one commentator suggests the elders would be referencing um, all who had been taught and were now subject to salvation and having victory in that. But with that being said, though, I'm all, we're always open to some other thoughts or ideas. And so, any thoughts or comments? Well, I kind of have a little bit of problem with that being the 12 apostles. Uh, since it says clothed in white robes, I can't imagine Judas being considered as one in a white robe. Well, look at them as, as not so much a literal group as a figurative group, okay? As just the, the, the apostles as a grouping. Not so much, you know, Peter, Andrew, James, and John specific, but just as, as a grouping of them, you know? And it's from the apostles that came the teachings. The white robe, as we'll talk about, is kind of representative or would appear to be representative of the... Purity. Yeah, purity or the sins being forgiven. You know, no longer having the, the sin-stained uh, clothing, but now they have all been washed uh, of their sins. Yeah. And it says and they had crowns of gold on their heads would possibly represent the victory that those who are in Jesus Christ have over those who are not. Um, any thoughts? Hunter? I forgot about that. I'd have to go back and look at that. But you're right. I mean, James was killed by Herod. Yeah, so then Paul, and then Paul, then Paul, Paul became an apostle. But I'd have to look and see the placement, but I think that's an interesting point. That is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I had, for, if, if you look at it like that way, Matthias did replace Judas without a question. And James was going to die, or did die, either immediately before or just after Paul was appointed. So you still end up with the 12 there. And it, it, it kind of seems like that the number 12 is very important as being representative because he keeps replacing. If to hold that number 12, yeah. he replaces. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't just go on with the work when somebody falls away or changes. Okay, yeah. Gene? Yeah, my point was not, my point was that we need, that we ought not to be absolute when we talk about 12 and 12. Right. And in so many cases, things that are in, in Revelation are prophetic. Uh, because there are other numbers that are, that are in the Revelation, that, like it talks about the 150,000, it talks about the tens of thousands and billions and yeah. billions and billions and billions. So these are, these are, uh, that's a use, use the title of the book of Revelation. 
These are not absolute, absolute numbers. I don't believe that you can take travel with Travis that is absolutely. Yeah, yeah. This, this it's is what this is. But it does represent, first of all, the original uh, tribes and the, law, and the law of Moses. Right. And then it, it could represent the original 12 as the, the, uh, as the gospel of Christ because it's yeah. during his lifetime. That new covenant. So, yeah. And th that's a very good point. Not so much focusing on the, the 12 and 12, but as what they represent, as far as what, you know, or what they could represent. Yeah. But I think we can run into trouble sometimes if we try to make each of those numbers absolute. Like yes. Like 150,000. Are there religious today that are only 150,000 are going to be saved? Yeah. So, the Job's Witness is 144,000. Yeah, we get trapped into that sort of thing. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, yeah. I've looked at several commentaries here while you were talking to everybody, and, and uh, there's a lot of opinions, but the general consensus is if you think about it in the Old Testament, you had 12 tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. In the New Testament, you had 12 apostles. Right. Existing apostles. Yes, there were 14, but uh, two were in non existence. Right. So the seats. Basically, the conclusion is that it's symbolic representing all of God's people. Yeah. And that's kind of what, what we're saying there at the outset. I think that's, I, I would have to agree with that. <laughs> that when you look at the 24 elders, it's representative of all of the people of God, both before the Old Covenant and, and the New Covenant of Jesus Christ. And, and as a matter of fact, when you think about it, when Christ died upon the cross of Calvary, everyone that had, was a faithful follower of God at that point had victory. You know, everybody who lived before the death of Christ and everyone who would live after the death of Christ and follow him has victory in Jesus Christ. Yeah. So to, to me, that seems, you know, when, when, you, when you ask yourself, well, what's, what's the number 24 and where is it found within the scriptures and what could it represent? Well, there's no 24 number, but there are two sets of 12, you know, and so it would seem at least a reasonable explanation to say that that's kind of what he was referencing there. To right. me, it also shows the old and the new coming together as far as, like you were saying, yes. that people of the Old Testament time who were faithfully following God had that victory, and then the people of the New Testament time had that victory. It wasn't just for one. It That's was right. for all time. That's, I would think that would work, yeah. And then the victory they have seen within the white robes and the crowns of gold. Um, and again, this is extremely important because they're facing a lot of persecutions. A lot of persecutions right now, and more would come, and they need to know that this is not the end, that they are victorious. Even if they die, physically, they're still victorious. Yeah. The idea of overcoming. All right, any other thoughts before we go on to, chapter, to verse 5? All right, let's see. <clears throat> so let's look at this imagery here for a moment. He says that from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. All righty, very interesting scene. What does he say first was proceeding forth from the throne? Lightning, thundering, flashes of light. Yeah, yeah. You've got lightnings, thunderings, and even voices there proceeding forth. Um, was there ever another point in time where we saw... A similar type of display when the presence of God uh, was near the people? <laughs> Mount, Sinai. Mount Sinai. Let's turn over there to Exodus 19, verse 16 for just a moment. Now this is where uh, he tells them in verse 15, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Then he says in verse 16, Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud of, on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. God's presence there being seen, his majesty, his glory, his, um, his power. That's exactly right. Um, and his honor, yeah. Any other, um, any other thoughts or comments about that? Hey, think about that when you're in a thunderstorm. Thunderings. Yeah. And that just gives you some sense of that. And I've, in funeral services, I've heard uh, individuals make comments that, uh, that uh, when a long time faithful servant died, heard thunder. Mm -hmm. And with God welcoming 
a faithful servant home. I've heard that said. You know. Yeah. Um, so there has always been significance to thunderings and lightnings in terms of the presence of God and the power of God. Okay, that's a good point. Um, any other thoughts? <clears throat> Jeremiah? Mm -hmm. um, this just proves how powerful God is whenever whenever he whenever we're in his present it we can't we should be scared it's it's scared in his present be, we should be we should be scared in his presence because it could be the judgment day okay well you think about it, he is the one and all we see within these images he is the final judge and the perfect judge yeah um so with that said let's look there at verse the latter part of verse five how many lamps of fire did you see burning? Seven. All right, seven lamps of fire there burning before the throne, um, which are the seven what? Spirits. All right. When was the last time, or when, I should say, when was the first time in what chapter we saw reference to seven spirits? Yeah, somewhere in the first. Cha chapter one. Yeah, going back to chapter one there. And, uh, yeah, in, in the, the beginning of this where he talks about well, that's true in reference to the seven churches of age as well. Um, the idea there is not literally that there were seven spirits of God, but seven is a what type of number? To, yeah, complete or a perfect number there. And so it's very likely that what he's referencing here again is the what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Yeah. Look at, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. Let's look over there. 1 Corinthians 12. Verses 4 and 5 for a moment. There we go. <laughs> okay. He says there are diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. In that idea, we know there's one Spirit, just as there's one Lord, and we look at he Ephesians 4 for others there. But it's the idea of the singular Holy Spirit or the singular Spirit of God, and sometimes it's referenced. Any thoughts, still? No, I'm just looking at the dispensation. I mean, you're talking about the various gifts there. Uh, and, and same thing, verse 5, there are different ministries, but the same Lord, one Lord, one faith. Uh, just dispensations of grace uh, by the Holy Spirit is what we're talking about here. Okay. And a similar thing there for being seen in Revelation chapter 4. Um, right. Did you notice in the Bible... Seven, since it's a perfect number, has came up so much in the Bible, it, it would make sense for it to pop up in the Bible so much. Like, okay, whenever the girl sneezed seven times. Oh, when, when she was raised? That little girl. She yeah. sneezed seven times. Because of it, Jethro's eyes. Now listen, the third grader can't stump me. It's just not acceptable. I forgot about that. A girl sees seven times. Probably in Luke's account, since he's a physician, he would be very detailed about those things, wouldn't he? But it the first time that seven is mentioned, that was in the creation. Yes, seven. Creation, seven days. All right. Uh, what about Proverbs chapter 6 or chapter 7? These six things the Lord hates, yea, seven are a... An abomination. abomination. Okay. Symbolizing the, the, the completeness of it. All right. Any other thoughts or comments? <laughs> it was when uh, uh, Elisha kills, Gehazi is there. Uh -huh. Elisha kills the, the child and she did, she sneezes seven times. Or he sneezes seven times. The child sneezes seven times. Okay. So look up Gehazi, Elijah, seven. <laughs> All right, that's y'all remember something that I forgot. That's pretty nice. The, Sh the Shelamite woman's son. Okay. That's true. Peter asked that question. Yeah, that's right. And in that particular case in point with uh, the, the Shelamite woman, if I remember correctly, it was um, just it was just after the Lord instigated the drought against uh, the nation of Israel, and and um, he he had, he stays where Elijah stays where he's at till the water runs dry. And then he goes on from there, and I think it's during that course, Elisha, not Elijah. Uh, Elisha ends up staying with the, the Shunammite woman. I think that's right. There's also two other references in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars. All right, mm -hmm. the mystery of the seven stars. And that kind of throws us back to with the seven churches of Asia and the seven yeah. stars that we're seeing. Yeah. And also mm -hmm. in the Pharaoh's dream that he brings to the seven, and how the seven bat house. 
That's right. That's true. So we're up to what? Uh, 49 so far? <laughs> seven times seven? Yeah. yeah. All right, very good, guys. Y'all are definitely paying attention to class. Um, oh, I don't, you almost made me forget something here, y'all. Um, <laughs> let's see. Where are we all together? There we go, verse five. Okay. All right, let me come back to verse five for just a minute here. <laughs> what do you think when he says seven lamps of fire? We're burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. What do you think the seven lamps of fire may represent? It's back to the seven churches of Asia and the fact that it's all congregations. Again, the idea of representing, because that every issue that a congregation has is pretty much brought up in those churches. Nope, absolutely nope. not. No, okay. I don't know. That's, that's, I had probably, that's, a good, that's, that's, that's a good option. All right, but what else? What, let, let's focus on the word here for just a moment. When he said seven lamps. All right. What do lamps do? Burn. Give light. All right. They, they give light. Okay. So lamps give forth light. Um, where do we find, how does the world find the light? Who brought that light into the Christ world? Christ is the light of the world. Christ is the light of the world. Or you can also say... The word. the word, all right? He is the Word. And so who delivered the Word into the world after Christ ascended up into heaven? But who gave it to the apostles? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Okay. So it could be here that, that, that he's talking about the, whole, the, the spirits of God, the Holy Spirit there, bringing the light into the world. So the lamps of fire were burning before the throne could represent the truth. You know, the truth that, that about regarding salvation that was delivered. Could be. So. Um, the only reason why I wouldn't so much say about the seven churches is because some of them, their candlestick was ready to be removed. Yeah. You know, in, in those cases like that. Could you uh, represent it reaching the whole world? We have seven yep. continents. <laughs> well, it's possible too. <laughs> yeah, all over the world, we have the number seven. Even we're, the, we're digging pretty good here. Even in the places that worship is banned that there are still people who, uh, who illegally worship God because they know it's right and it's the truth. That's true. That's true. That's right. Yeah. All right. So, so it, but, uh -huh. I mean, if you read the whole sentence, the seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. The lamps being the spirits of God. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's what was brought into the world. And really think about Jesus when he, he, it was said two different ways. He said in chapter 14 that the Father would send the Spirit to them, the Comforter. He said in chapter 16, I will send the Spirit of Truth. Okay. So this Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, the Comforter, is what revealed the Word to the world after Jesus ascended up into heaven. Brought, made that light known into the world in that way. Based on what everybody's already said about the number seven, mm -hmm. which is uh, merely a symbolic uh, indication of the perfection of the Holy Spirit. That's right. You said he was revealing to you all those things I said to you. Yep. That's right. So that's full exactly. Right. Full, that's right. Full revelation. Yep. So seven is definitely, we see a lot of it being used as a complete perfect number. That's why my parents were going to name me seven. <laughs> All right, so let's continue. <laughs> they thought otherwise. <laughs> they took one look and said zero. Well, they won't go for that, so we better just call them John. Oh, it's not? No. All righty. Okay, let's continue now here. Um, they're in verse 6 now. What does he say before the throne there was? Sea of glass. Sea of glass like crystal, okay? And in the midst of the throne and around the throne, what did he see? Four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Okay. Now let's talk for a minute about the, the sea of glass, the crystal there. I mentioned at the outset that um, if this is the same sea, we see in Revelation 21, verse 1, it is removed. Okay, there's see no more. And so, if in this throne room scene right here, we, we, we have this right here that represents 
the throne and all the realms around the throne that are the, the beings around the throne. And we see this sea that's surrounding the throne. It may be that this throne, this sea, separates us from God. Okay, And then by the end, when judgment is here, the sea is no more. It could therefore then reflect at that point access to God. Possibly, you know. God judges us. God judges us Exactly. So it, it, it could be, I don't say this exactly what it is, but it is interesting that, it, this, that it, if it's the same thing, that it goes away. Okay. But so he, see, he has a sea, sees this, can't talk, can I? He sees a sea of glass there around the throne. And in the midst of it, how many living creatures were there? Yeah, there were four living creatures there um, around the throne there. And what does it say about their eyes? Yes. So these were all mothers, weren't they? <laughs> Go ahead, Heather. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a very good, good way of observing that. It's likely, or it's possible, that the the eye, the full of eyes in front and back, shows basically that these four creatures would be able to look over all of God's creation. That nothing would go unseen. That everything would be fully observed, uh, leaning to not because it's the creatures and not God Himself, um, not necessarily showing the uh, the omnipresence of God. But it does kind of suggest that they were all seeing and watched over all of his creation, possibly. Yeah. All right. Any thoughts, Gene? It's kind of an, kind of an everyday example. Um, kids say their mothers have got eyes in the back of their head. Yes. That you don't get away with anything. I think it's the sense that the boys are talking about. It's all seeing eyes, front and back, all directions. And there are four of them, which would suggest they were on four. Four points of the compass, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. All in all directions. That's right. That's right. And we'll kind of see a breakdown of them here in just a moment. But yeah, uh, the four corners of the world. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts? The word beast is not a good word here. The yes. Greek, the Greek word actually means living being. Yeah. The, the King James Version renders it there in verse 7 with the term beast. And um, it says the first beast was like a lion. And Dale's right, that's not a good translation for that. Yeah, living, living creature is kind of a better way of looking at that there. Matter of fact, you look at the American Standard Version, they recognize that. The English Standard Version as well. And the, um, I need to get the American Standard Version in here. I have it, I just don't have it on this one. All right, so that's a very good point. So there in verse 7 then, he says the first living creature was like a what? Uh, he was like a lion. Now, as with everything, we're looking at possible symbolism. But before we go any farther, have we seen different imageries like this in other Bible passages? Daniel. Sure. Who? Daniel. Daniel, exactly. Daniel carries some very um, solid imagery regarding that. Ezekiel, though... Yeah. Yeah, let's go over to um, Ezekiel chapter 1 for just a moment. And let's look at three verses there in Ezekiel chapter 1. The first one we'll start with there is verse 5. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 5. Ezekiel writes, Also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance, they had the likeness of a man. Now let's come down to verse 8. And he says, the hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides, and each of their four had faces and wings. And then come down to verse 15, I believe it is. He says, now as I looked at the living creatures, behold, a will was on the earth beside each living creature with its four faces. So again, it's, if, when we see something that seems completely foreign to New Testament writing. And it's clearly a vision we have to ask ourselves, well, is there anything else like this in the Old Testament that might help us? You know, prophets did, did a kind service when they explained what they saw. In Daniel's visions, as Kelvin pointed out there, in Daniel's visions, there was a lot of explanation regarding what was seen. John gives us very little explanation regarding what some of these visions represent. 
um, or the, the elements of the vision represents. So we have to go back and look a little bit and see what we can glean from other instances. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you uh, Brother Harkwriter's thoughts on verse 7 regarding the likenesses. Um, first off, when he talks about the first living creature was like a lion, he makes the point here that, um, let's see, um, it would certainly be a, oh here, the symbolism of four living creatures around God's throne is also found in Ezekiel, the three passages we read, and 18, not 15 is what I should have read, where living creatures are identified as cherubims. And we didn't read that, but in Ezekiel 10, 20, the things that Ezekiel saw were cherubims. So he says it would have certainly be appropriate that God, that around God's throne there would appear cherubims. Maybe that's what these were, represented elsewhere in scriptures as a very high order of angels who execute the will of God. Think about the Garden of Eden. The Lord put a cherubim there to block the entrance there to the garden. And when they made the Ark of the Covenant, they put two cherubims with their wings outstretched there. And so, based on Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 20, it may be that what he was seeing were cherubims. Okay. Now, the faces, he says the lion, sometimes called the king of the jungle, represents strength. The calf, or ox, among domesticated animals, is a beast of patience, service, and endurance. Man signifies intelligence, reason, and wisdom. And then an, angel, an eagle, the presence of the skies, perhaps represents penetrating vision and swiftness. So he writes, these living creatures are special servants of God, strong, swift, intelligent, and always vigilant. The highest of the heavenly hosts serve the Father. Sound like a reasonable explanation of the four creatures here that John sees. Um, any thoughts or comments about that? Um, <laughs> yeah, it, if there's going to be anything, it would be a, a, a rank. Um, the best way that we and, and our limited minds could understand it. You have a seraphim and then a sheriffim, 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 and you have an archangel, like Michael, the archangel. Um, they would basically be rank, as best as we can understand it. You know, I, I, I really doubt, I, I doubt that in heaven, in the spiritual realm, you've got a, a, a true lineup as we would think about it in hierarchy and order. You know, you've got a head angel and then subservience angels. But it's the way that it's pictured for us so that we could understand it. And, but that would be one of the difference I would suspect there. Any other thoughts? Well, I think when we have an angel with a name, because God has sent that angel on a specific message, specific mission, and He wants people to know who it yeah. is. And therefore, we the people would look at Him and see yeah. the authority there within that angel. Yeah, that's a very good point. All righty. Any other thoughts on verse seven? All right. Let me see into verse eight here. We are about out of time. Um, we'll look briefly at verse 8, but we'll probably start here again uh, next, next uh, Tuesday, Lord willing, there. But notice here, he talks about the four living creatures. And what he says about them is that the four living creatures, each having how many wings? Six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And notice this, they do not rest day or night saying... Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now imagine that. Imagine in that imagery that John saw, what he heard. He heard them, these four living creatures, continuously, and we'll find later in the text, not even resting for a moment, praising the Lord with holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Any thoughts? God never rests his oversight over us. Yes. That's true. We can, and we can never escape that sight. That's right. That's a very good point. Um, remember with the, with the battle at Mount Carmel there? Elijah says, maybe your God's on vacation. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he's taking a break. <laughs> Our God never does. His job is continuous. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts? It's also indicates like the 24 again. The four with the six wings. Oh, that's an interesting point there. 
The four living creatures, each having six wings there. Okay. Um, I need to cover that. need to look at that. All the 24 were covering everybody. Yeah, the full coverage there. Especially with the eyes there around and within. Imagine that with the 24 hours a day. That's true. 24 hours a day. 24 months and two years. They watch, <laughs> they watch, 20, they watch 24 hours. And they watch 24 hours without rest so they can make sure. That's right. That's right. That means it's ever hidden from God. That's right. And ultimately, that's what we see with some of these imageries here. That the fact that the eyes were front and back, around and within, is kind of the idea of the all-seeing nature, the all-observant nature of what we're looking at. And I'm, I'm going to do a little more research into the, the aspect of the wings here, and then we'll, we'll pick up with this, with this next Tuesday. The seraphim has six wings. The seraphim has six wings from Ezekiel's text. Ezekiel's yeah, that's a good point. Oh, Isaiah 6 2. Okay, the seraphim there had six wings. Oh, okay, that's right. Okay. Um, any other thoughts? All right, appreciate everyone uh, joining us this morning. Uh, it's good to see you, Miss Laura, there in on the, um, the world of the internet watching us. Appreciate you being with us today. And um, we will have the Scriptural Way broadcast tonight at 7 30 at live.scripturalway.org. All right. Any other final thoughts or comments? Say good morning to Sister Laura for me. Oh, Sister Laura, Brother Jim at first and says good morning. <laughs> says good morning to you. <laughs> All righty. Uh, appreciate everyone coming out. And Dale, if you would, I'll have you to dismiss us in a word of prayer.